we were learning about Ibrahim alayhi salam. The surah is Surah Al-Anbiya, the surah which talks about the prophets. And we learned about Ibrahim alayhi salam that how when he was still very young, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him rushd, right guidance, and also the ability to remain firm on that guidance. Think about Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's born and raised in a people who worship idols. Generally what happens? Whatever we see people doing from the very beginning, we accept it. We think this is what we're supposed to do. This is life. Don't question it. Just do everything. Why? Because everybody does it. Just follow the crowd. But Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah gave him rushd. What's the sign of rushd? That you don't blindly accept everything. You use your mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And that also doesn't mean that you don't put any restrictions on the use of your mind. Because sometimes we think that we should also question what Allah has revealed. Right? You should not blindly accept everything that the Qur'an says. Rushd, right conduct, is to recognize things as they are. To follow the truth, to recognize the truth. And what is truth? That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared is the truth. So for us, what is the criterion? The revelation, what Allah has said. We have to check everything according to revelation. Does it contradict the revelation or does it confirm it? So if something confirms what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, go ahead, do it. No problem. But where it contradicts, what Allah has said, then that is where we must prefer revelation over culture. We must prefer deen over the customs of the people that we are living in. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he used his rushd, his mind, the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him, and he questioned his people, his father, that why is it that you worship these idols, these things that you have made yourself? And then when they said, this is what we have found our forefathers doing since always. And this is the reason why we do it. Ibrahim a.s. said, you and your forefathers are in pure error. Just because you find somebody doing something doesn't mean it's okay. Which means that even if a thousand people are doing something, it doesn't mean you have to do it too. Just because a million people are doing something doesn't mean you have to do it too. Just because five million people like a video and watch it doesn't mean you have to do it too. No. Don't be a blind follower. Use your mind. Use the knowledge that Allah has given. And then, when the people did not understand Ibrahim a.s., he wanted to have further conversation with them in order to do da'wah to them. And he wanted to prove to his people that how these idols that you worship cannot benefit you, nor can they protect you from any harm. And in order to do that, when his people went away for their festival, what did he do? He broke the idols. Correct? And he spared the biggest of them. So what happened? When people came and they saw that all of their idols were shattered, they were broken, they said, whoever did this is a great zalim. And they said that there is a boy, يُقَالُ لَهُ Ibrahim, who is known as Ibrahim. We heard him saying something negative about our gods. He was questioning them. So they summoned him. And Ibrahim a.s. says, ask these gods. بَلْ فَعْلَهُ كَبِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ That the biggest of these idols, he is the one who broke the rest of them. So ask him, ask these idols if they can speak. So with this, the people realized that what they had been doing of worshipping the idols was wrong. Because if these idols cannot even speak in their defense, if they cannot even speak to get help, then how can they help us? And how can they defend us? So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he made them realize. But what happened? Then the people, nukisu ala ru'usim, they turned back. They regressed. You see, when a person is sick, then what happens? Eventually, as they take treatment, they get better. Their condition improves. There is progress. But then what happens after some time, if they are not taking their treatment properly? Then instead of getting better, they relapse. They go back in their sickness. Right? Instead of getting better, they get worse. So this is what happened to the people, to the state of their hearts. Instead of increasing in their guidance, what happened? They fell back. 
Now why is it that sometimes a person is on the right way? He's going in the right direction. But then all of a sudden, he goes back, reverses. Why? What caused that? Could be many things. Sometimes it's one's own ego. Their own ego. That if I listen to him and if I admit that I was wrong, then that humiliates me. That puts me in a very bad position. I am accepting that everything that I have been doing so far was wrong and that my forefathers were also wrong. So just for the sake of big name, what happens sometimes? People go back to their wrong ways. It's their pride. It's their arrogance. And this is exactly what happened to the people of Ibrahim a.s. So what happened? They made a huge fire. And in defense of their gods, what did they do? They threw Ibrahim a.s. In that fire. They said, Harriku, burn him. Burn him when he's alive. Not kill him and then burn his body. What did they say? Burn him when he is alive. And this is something very serious. Burning a person who is alive? Burning them to death? This is something very serious. You see, there are different ways of killing a person. And burning to death is one of the worst ways. And this is something that we as people are not to do. Why? Because who alone has the right to throw people in fire? Who? Only Allah Azza wa Jal. We as human beings don't possess that right. Allah is the only one who can give this form of punishment. So anyway, what did they do? They said, Habriquhu, burn him. And they threw him in the fire. What happened? Ibrahim alayhi salam, as he's thrown in the fire, Allah said to the fire, Ya naur, kuni, bardan, wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Be coolness and safety for Ibrahim. Fire, what does it do generally? What's the law of this universe? Fire will burn. Will it save something? No, no, no. It will destroy it. Isn't it? So fire generally burns and it destroys. So for instance, if there's a building and there's fire over there, what will happen to that building? Destroy it. If you have a piece of cloth, and you light it on fire, what's going to happen to it? Destroy it. If there's a piece of furniture, if there's a forest, and there's fire, what will happen to that forest? Destroy it. Correct? So fire generally destroys. It's destructive. Its nature is destructive. But we see over here that the very nature of the fire was changed. Instead of burning, it became coolness. Instead of destroying, it became safety. For who? For Ibrahim a.s. Why? Why? How? How did this miracle occur? At Allah's command. At Allah's command. Because remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is fa'alun lima yurid. He does whatever He wants. He does whatever He wants. Nothing is difficult for Him. The entire creation is His creation. وَالْخَلْقُ خَلْقُ The entire creation is His. And that includes the fire and wood and water and ice and snow and wind and everything. Every force of nature belongs to who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there is a system that Allah has created and that is known as sunnah kawniyya. Right? Which is Allah's usual way right, of bringing about things in the universe. Usual way. So for instance, fire. Usually, what's a sunnah kawniya? It will burn. Usually, it will destroy. Correct? Now, these all different makhluk, what are they? They are asbab. They are means. They are a means through which certain goals are accomplished. So for instance, if a forest has to be burnt, then what needs to be done? What means have to be adopted? Fire, right? If something needs to be made uh, cold, then what means must be adopted? Ice, water, right? Cooler temperatures, correct? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember, He is above asbab. He is not limited to asbab, to the means. He accomplishes his goal, his irada, he executes his will, bil asbab, 
وبدون الأسباب وبضد الأسباب. He accomplishes his goals with means, without means, and also by going against the usual asbab. You understand? So, with means, the sunnah kawniya, generally fire would burn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that. But He can also cause something to burn without fire. And He can also cause something to burn with something cold. It's up to Him. He can do whatever He wants. Because He is Allah. He is Khaliq. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Qadir, Al-Qadir, Al-Muqtadir. The one with perfect ability. So when a servant goes in the way of Allah, when a servant strives to remain firm upon the haqq, then you think Allah will not help him? With means, without means, and also by going against the means? Can he not do that? Of course Allah will. And this is the lesson that we're being given over here. You do your best and leave your affair with Allah. Leave your affair with Allah. He will take care of you. He will protect you. He will make you successful. But what's the condition? You give it your best. You do your best. And this is what we learn from the examples of all the prophets that are mentioned over here. So from the story of Ibrahim, we see that fire, instead of destroying, it becomes a means of security and safety for Ibrahim. Because who was ultimately protecting him? Was it the fire? Was it his father? Who was ultimately protecting him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this was great comfort for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. Because when he was doing da'wah in Makkah, how many people had believed? Not the majority. Very few people. And then many of them were weak or they had become weak since they had accepted Islam. So generally when the servant of Allah compares his worldly material condition with others, he begins to think that he doesn't have anything. He doesn't have the time, he doesn't have the energy, he doesn't have the resources. Others, they have so much more. What can I do? Don't worry. You do your best. What happened at Badr? Were there not 300 Muslims? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not give them success despite their lack of numbers? He did, right? So leave the results with who? Allah azza wa jal. What is our responsibility? What is our part? Do our best. Follow the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, when his people expelled him, and when he was thrown in the fire, what happened? Jibreel came, right? And he asked, can I do something for you? Can I do something for you? And what was the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam? That, no, I don't want your help. I don't want anything from you. Allah will save me. He will rescue me. And what did he say? Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Sufficient for us is Allah and what an excellent wakil he is. Meaning someone whom you do tawakkul on. Excellent he is to rely on. Because when a servant relies on him, then Allah will never fail him. Allah will never disappoint him. Even the believers, they said this when, remember when the battle of Uhud took place? And the Muslims had just barely gotten back into Medina that they were told that the mushrikeen are coming back to attack you. And they were wounded, hurt. Physically as well as emotionally. But what happened? What was their response? وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ Allah is sufficient for us. It is said that even Hajar, when she was left in the desert by Ibrahim a.s. and Ibrahim a.s. was going away, Hajar said the same words. حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ So any person who says this, any person who says this at a time of distress, at a time of difficulty, he says these words with full faith, then Allah will take care of his affairs. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ When we saved him, وَلُوطًا And also Lut. Allah saved him and Lut إِلَى الْأَرْضِ To the land الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ Which we have blessed in the words. So in other words, Ibrahim a.s. He left those people and he went to the most blessed land of that time. And which was that land? The land of Palestine. And he was not alone. He had with him Lut and Sarah. وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقِ And we gifted to him Ishaq. وَيَعْقُوبِ And also Ya'qub. 
Allah gave to Ibrahim a gift. What gift? The gift of a child. Which child? Ishaq. And Ishaq remember that he was born 12 years after Ismail was born. And Allah did not just give him Ishaq as a son, but after Ishaq also wa Ya'quba. And Ya'qub, who was Ya'qub The son of Ishaq So basically, Ibrahim salam's grandson. And Allah says, wa Ya'qub, Allah gave him Ya'qub nafila, as a nafil. Nafila from the root letters nun falam. Does that remind you of a word? Nafil, nafil prayers. Right? Nafil fast. What is nafil? Voluntary. Something that you don't have to do, but you do it voluntarily. Out of your own volition. Right? So, for instance, when you are performing nafil prayers, what's the reason? You want to make Allah even more happy with you. Right? You want to earn Allah's pleasure. Fasting on Monday and Thursday is not obligatory, but you do it anyway. Nafil. Why? Because you want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's done out of eagerness on your part. You understand? So Allah gave Ibrahim a.s. the grandson, which grandson? Ya'qub, as a gift, as an extra gift, as an extra favor. Ibrahim a.s. wanted children. And what did Allah give him? Not just children, but also grandchildren. وَكُلًّا And all, جَعَلْنَا we made صَالِحِينَ Righteous. All were righteous. Ibrahim was righteous. Ishaq was righteous. Yaqub was righteous. They were all prophets and they were all good. And we made them a'immatan, leaders. Who? Who were all leaders? Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, a'immah, plural of imam. They were leaders of the people of their time and also leaders of the people who came after them. If you think about it, Ibrahim, we take him as a leader, as an example. In the way he submitted to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the way that he was patient at times of adversity. In the way that he accepted every command that Allah gave him. A leader, an example. To be followed. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً Leaders of their people. يَهْدُونَ amrina. But as leaders, what did they do? What did they do? When you think about a leader, you think a person who has a lot of power. Right? A person who's given a lot of gifts and he's paid really well, right? And he eats a lot of food and he can do whatever he wants. This is what we think a leader is. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? They were leaders in that yahduna bi amrina. They would guide people by our command. Meaning whatever command Allah had given, they observed it themselves and they also told people about it. This is the job of the leader. To lead people in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To ensure that people know what they have to do. And to ensure that people are also doing it. يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ And we inspired to them. We did wahi to them, meaning we taught them. And we inspired them. With what? فِعْلَ Doing of al-khayrat, of good things. Good works. Khayrat, plural of khayr. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught them what good things to do. The different forms of goodness, different forms of good deeds. What to do, when to do, how much to do, where to do. You know, for instance, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he constructed the Kaaba, what did he say? Wa arina manasikana. Oh Allah, show us our rituals, meaning now teach us as to what we should do here also. What should we do? Ibrahim alayhi salam didn't make it up, didn't make hajj up. Alright? He didn't say, okay, let's do this ritual and then let's make up that ritual. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who taught him that this is how you should worship me. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, remember that in the early years of prophethood, right at the beginning, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the command to pray. The believers were told to pray. It was part of being a Muslim. And how many times would they pray? Twice a day. And how many raka'ah? Just two. And it was not fard. Okay, It was not fard. The way salah is fard right now, it was not fard in that way. And during salah, people would even talk to each other. They could. Okay, This was right at the beginning. Because think about it. Few Muslims living in Mecca in a very hostile environment where they have to keep their religion private and then secret. Okay, So for that reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually revealed the commands. Right, This is what we learn. The commands were given gradually. 
So right at the beginning, when the Prophet ﷺ was given the command to pray, Jibreel was sent, and Jibreel taught the Prophet ﷺ how to do wudu and how to pray also. Jibreel, he showed it, how to do wudu and how to pray. And it is said that this is the teaching that Jibreel brought after the second revelation. What was the first revelation? Iqra. What was the second revelation? Second wahi. Ya ayyuhal muddathir. Because the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel for the second time, all right, and Jibreel was covering the entire horizon. The Prophet ﷺ ran back home. And when he went home, he said, Dathiruni, Zammiluni, cover me, cover me. He was afraid for himself. And then he was brought the revelation that, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'andir. Get up and warn. Get out of the state of comfort and warn people. Wa thiyabaka fatahir. Wa rujza fahjur. Clean your clothes. All right? Meaning, keep yourself clean. After this revelation, what was the next message that Jibreel brought? How to do wudu and how to pray. إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ This has been the way of Allah. Every prophet was inspired, was taught how to do good. So good is not something that we make up ourselves. Alright? Good is what? What Allah has taught. That is good. Because a person might think, you know, for instance, when it comes to udhiyah, when it comes to slaughtering animals at hajj, a person might say, you know what, I don't think there's any need to slaughter an animal over here because people have so much food that they're throwing it away. There's more food than there are people. So instead, I am going to donate the exact amount to a hospital. Can you do that? No, if you do that, that is not khair. You understand? Khair is what? What Allah has taught, what Allah wants from us in a situation, at a time, the very quantity, the very method, that is khayrat. So, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ And this also shows that how the prophets, they were taught how to do good. So what were they doing? What were they busy doing? Sleeping? What were they doing? Good. And أَوْحَيْنَا Allah inspired them. Because you see, sometimes you know what good you should do. But you just don't see the opportunity. Or even if you see the opportunity, you don't avail it. You understand? Like for instance, you could be sitting in a group of people and you see that someone is clearly thirsty, all right, or they're clearly in need of water because they're having spicy food and you can see their eyes going red, all right, and they're not able to eat. Now one is that you just sit there and look at them and say, the food is spicy, right? And they're like, yeah, and they have a baby in their hand and they're trying to eat at the same time. One is that you think, or you say to them, have some water. And then you just go back on your phone and do what you're doing and keep eating your food. But the other is that you get that idea that, oh, she needs water. Before she asks me, or before she puts her crying baby down and struggles to go get water, I should get up and go get the water for her. You see, you get that idea, you get that thought. You avail that opportunity to do good. Allah gave you the ability. Allah gave you that understanding, that chance. And then you seized it. This is what awhayna ilayhim fi'l al Because so many times we have opportunities right before us. But we don't avail them. We don't. Whose loss is it? Our loss. So wa awhayna ilayhim fi'l al To ask Allah, Ya Allah, inspire me to do good also. So that Every moment of my life, every day of my life is a productive, useful day that brings me ajr in the akhirah. Not that one day after the other goes by and I've accomplished nothing in my life. Make good easy for me. وَيَسِّرِ الْهُدَىٰ إِلَيْهِ وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ وَإِقَامَ الصَّلَىٰ And also establishing the prayer. Meaning Allah also taught them, also instructed them to establish the prayer. وَإِتَاءَ الزَّكَاةِ And also giving the zakah. وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ And all of them were for us servants. All of them were Allah's servants. They were righteous servants. وَلُوطًا And also Lut. Meaning, mention Lut also. آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا We gave him hukm, judgment. And remember that hukm is not just good sound judgment, but also wisdom. And it's also understood as prophethood. So to Lut, 
we gave prophethood, sound judgment, wisdom, وَعِلْمَ and also knowledge. Lut alayhi salam, remember when he left from Iraq with Ibrahim alayhi salam? Ibrahim alayhi salam, he first went to Egypt. Alright, and if you ever look at the map, Iraq is here, Egypt is here, alright, to the west of Iraq. Okay, and then under Iraq, or rather close to it, is Asham. Okay, so in a way, Asham is on the way to Egypt from Iraq. Alright. So Ibrahim Rasam he first went to Egypt. He went to Misr. And then from Misr, he went to Palestine. Now when he left Iraq, Ibrahim and Sarah, they proceeded. Lut alayhi salam, he was sent to the towns of Suddum to do da'wah over there. To call people to haq over there. Why? Because the people of the entire region, the entire region were being harassed by the people of Sudum. Because the people of Sudum, what would they do? They were highway robbers. Alright? And remember, at that time, people would travel frequently for the purpose of trade, to get food. I mean, if you run out of wheat, you can't just order it online. Okay? If you run out of food, you can't go to the supermarket and just buy it. No. You have to get together with some people and then travel with them and find out about a place where there's food available and go purchase it from there. And there were these trade routes that people would travel through. And Sudum, the towns of Sudum, they were right on these trade routes. And if people are going to buy food, what do they have with them? Money or something of value? And if they're returning... With food now, what do they have? Food. So whether you attack them when they're going to buy food or you attack them when they're going home, in either case, you're going to get something from them. So the people of Sudum would loot the trade caravans. So the people of the entire region were being harassed by them. All right? And they wouldn't just attack them and loot them, but also kill the people, and not just kill them, but sexually assault them. Sexually assault them. Any visitor, remember when the angels went in the form of human beings, all right, and they were taken in by Lut as guests. Did the people spare those guests? So you understand what they would do. They wouldn't spare anyone, any passerby, any traveler, someone who came and just took a stop there to get some rest, anyone, doesn't matter if they were guests or who, if they saw something in them that they could use, that they could enjoy, they would go ahead and enjoy themselves. So Lut was sent over there by Ibrahim by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? In order to do da'wah to them, in order to stop people of Sudum from such actions. So what happened? Lut when he was there, Allah gave him hukm and ilm. Because who was he dealing with? A very difficult people. So you have to be equipped with not just knowledge, but wisdom also. How to talk to people. Because imagine a child that is very misbehaved, extremely bad behavior. Can you just tell that child, this is not how you should sit. This is not how you should eat. If you just give them instructions, will they listen? Oh no, they'll spit on your face. Right? They'll just walk away. They might throw something at you. Isn't it? What do you need? Wisdom in order to get through to them. Wisdom. So Allah gave Lut salam wisdom. And remember, Allah gives wisdom. Yu'til hikmata mayyasha. So if ever you were dealing with someone very difficult, whether they are younger in age or older in age or similar, if you're dealing with someone difficult and you're telling them the right stuff, right information, but they're not listening, what do you need? What do you need? Wisdom. Ask Allah for wisdom. Ask Allah for wisdom. Walad jainahu. Lut did his best. But did the people listen to him? No. Walad jainahu. So we saved him min al-qarya from the town. Allati kanat, which used to ta'malu. It would do al-khaba'is. The khabith actions. Wicked deeds. The entire community, the entire qarya, the entire nation was involved in some form of 
خبیث action. Whether that خبیث action was sexually assaulting others or it was uh, taking their property or it was killing them, whatever it was, they were busy in khaba'is. In Surah Al-Ankabut, Ayah 28 to 29, their khaba'is are described in detail. That, أَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ الرِّجَالَ وَتَقْطَعُونَ السَّبِيلِ وَتَأْتُونَ فِي نَادِيكُمُ الْمُنْكَرِ Three things are mentioned here. First of all, you approach men. You approach men, meaning men fulfill their sexual desire with other men. Secondly, تَقْطَعُونَ السَّبِيلِ You obstruct the road. People who are traveling, you harass them. And thirdly, وَتَأْتُونَ فِي نَادِيكُمُ الْمُنْكَرِ In your gatherings, what do you do? You commit munkar. You commit bad actions. Whether it is of sexual nature or whatever it was, but in their gatherings, they would do extremely wicked actions. So at every level, كَانَتْ تَعْمَلُ الْخَبَائِثِ Now living in such people also, how difficult it must have been for Lut a.s. You know, if you have to spend some time with a person who uses foul language, bad words, at the end of every other sentence is a four-letter word, what do you feel like doing? You feel like, you know, you had some tolerance for such words, but then you're like, I can't handle this anymore. I cannot handle this anymore. Right? Now imagine, Lut a.s. he's living amongst people who are committing all of these actions. So when Allah uses the word najjaynahu, this was literally Allah saved him. Allah rescued him. He saved him from those people because living in them was torture. Innahum kanu qawma saw'in. Indeed, they were a people of evil. The entire nation was engrossed in evil. And they were fasiqeen. People who were defiantly disobedient, crossed limits. وَأَدْخَلْنَاهُ فِي رَحْمَتِنَا And we admitted him into our mercy. Allah admitted Lut a.s. into his mercy. What does that mean? That Allah saved him from his people. إِنَّهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Indeed he was of the righteous. You see, every person, every individual wants to be with who? Those who are like-minded, those who are like him. Those who think the same, those who have similar goals. Right? Why do you think people have so much difficulty finding the perfect spouse? Why? Because they check every individual. No, 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 no. He doesn't like the kind of food that I like. No, no, no. I don't like the way he dresses. Right? I don't like the fact that he just wants a 9 to 5 job. I don't like the fact that he wants me to work. You know, different things. But when you see someone who has similar thinking like yours, what do you think? It's possible. But if you see someone who has a completely different lifestyle, then what do you think? This cannot work out. Right? So, Lut a.s. Allah says, He was min al-saliheen. He was of the righteous. And he was living amongst who? Who? Fasiqeen. Sinners. Extremely disobedient people. And it was not easy. But he was doing this for whose sake? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many times, we are also put in a situation that we do not like. We cannot agree with the people that we are living with, that we are working with. We look at things very differently. We disagree with them over everything. But we cannot cut off from them. And we cannot run away either. Ask Allah to make a way out for you. Ask Allah to solve that situation for you. Because remember that وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ Whoever fears Allah, Allah creates an exit for him. Allah solves that situation for him, that problem for him. And while you are in that situation, keep doing what you're supposed to. Because sometimes we say, oh, I'm using all this bad language because I go to public school. Not my fault, my parents' fault. They put me in that school. So I hear all these bad words and so I have to say them as well. No, you don't have to say them. Just because you hear them. You don't have to. You don't have to become like everybody else. Yes, your company has an effect on you. However, remember that if you are salih, and if you wish to be salih, if you wish to remain righteous, then Allah will protect you. But you have to try also. So, وَأَدْخَلْنَاهُ فِي رَحْمَتِنَا إِنَّهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ 
wa Nuhan and Nuh alayhi salam also remember him id nada min qablu when he called to Allah before before who before who when did Nuh alayhi salam come before Ibrahim alayhi salam or after Ibrahim alayhi salam before because remember that Nuh alayhi salam he was the first rasul right the first messenger there were anbiya before him prophets before him but he was the first rasul and Nuh alayhi salam he came very early on and Ibrahim Rasam came much later. Right? So when Nuhan is Nada min Kablu and Nuh when he called to Allah before, meaning before Ibrahim and Lut, Fastajabna Lahu. So we responded to him. We didn't waste his dua. Fanajainahu and we saved him. Wa ahlahu and his family or his people, those who believed in him. Because the son of Nuh salam, one of his sons did not believe. Right? So Ahl doesn't just apply to family, but it also applies to followers. So we saved him and his followers. From what? Min al karb al azim. From the great karb. What is karb? Kaf ba. Karb is al gham shadid. Al gham. Gham. Distress. That is shadid. Severe. Severe distress. Severe anxiety. Severe agony. Allah saved him from severe agony. What was that agony, that pain, that torture that he was in? What was it? What was the distress that Nuh salam was in? Okay, before that. His people. You see, Nuh salam, he did da'wah to his people for how many years? 950 years. And that is not a small number. If we have to talk to somebody for nine and a half minutes, we begin to think that we are in distress. If we have to work with somebody very difficult for nine years or for nine days or nine months, that is distress. Nuh was constantly doing da'wah to his people for 950 years. And he had exhausted all efforts in doing so. All efforts. If you read Surah Nuh, we learn that Nuh alayhi salam, he said that I have called out to my people by night and by day, openly and privately. And I called out to them loudly. Nuh alayhi salam, he was rebuked by his people. He was insulted. He was physically abused by his people. We learn that Surah Al-Qamar, Ayah 9, كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ فَكَذَّبُوا عَبْدَنَا وَقَالُوا مَجْنُونٌ وَزْدُجِرْ They called him a madman and he was uzdujira. He was repelled. He was yelled at. People scolded him. People became upset with him. They opposed him. They didn't let him be. Wazdujir. So this was karb al azim extreme agony. And that fear that if my people don't believe, then what? Then what? Can I walk away from them? No. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been assigned to feed a child? Maybe your sister's kid or your brother's kid or your cousin, a little kid? Hmm? And then you're sitting in front of them and you have the food and you're like, come on, eat, open your mouth, open your mouth. And the mouth is sealed shut. It's sealed shut. And you try to make stories and you try to bring airplanes and God knows what. You use your imagination and you spend like 45 minutes trying to feed that child. And what does he do? He just pushes the plate away and all the food is gone. It's on the floor. And now you have a mess to deal with, a messy child, a messy you, a messy floor. And a big loser. <laughs> That's what you have to deal with. Now, if it's your sister's child, next time you can tell her, you know what, if you want me to watch your kid, please feed him before you send him to me. I can't feed him. It's beyond me. Now, you can leave the feeding of that child to your sister. Can the mother say this? Can the mother do this? Have you ever seen a mother saying to her child, you don't want to eat, don't eat, go hungry. <sighs> I mean, she'll say this, but she doesn't mean it. She never means it. It's supposed to be a threat. But then what happens when the child sits back, you're like, 
you know, you're telling them a story and try to shove something into their mouth, right? And then you feel like you're going to go crazy. You're going to go insane. Because that child is not eating. You can't even leave them hungry. Because if you leave them hungry, that's not good for them. What do you want to do? Run away. Can you run away? No, you cannot. Can you leave the child hungry? No, you cannot. Can you force the food into the mouth? No, you can't. You find yourself so helpless. And this is with food, physical health. The results of which are very, you know, the consequences of which are very, I mean, minimal. What's the big deal? But if a person is not accepting Iman, then what? It will put you in agony. It will put you in distress that this person is heading straight to hellfire. And they don't realize it. They don't understand it. Nuh salam worked for 950 years. He exhausted all his efforts. Whatever was within his means, he did it to convey the message. And then what happened? Eventually, ultimately, Nuh salam he called out to his Lord, فَدَعَا رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَغْلُوبٌ فَانْتَصِرْ In Surah Al-Qamr, Ayah 10. He called out to his Lord, that, O oh my Lord, أَنِّي مَغْلُوبٌ I have been overcome. I have been overpowered. I'm defeated. فَانْتَصِرْ So you help. It's beyond me. You help. So that is what is mentioned here. وَنُوحًا إِذْ نَادَى مِنْ قَبْلُ When he called out, asking Allah for help against his people. But this was when? After 950 years of hard work. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we responded to him. Because when a person exhausts all of his efforts in trying to do something, all of his efforts, he does his best, and then he raises up his hands, begging Allah, then you know what? That is the dua for which the doors of the heavens are opened. That is the dua which is not rejected. Because it is from the heart. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we responded to him. فَنَجَّيْنَاهُ We saved him وَأَهْلَهُ And his followers مِنَ الْكَرْبِ الْعَظِيمِ From the extreme distress. If you think about it, الْكَرْب What is كَرْب? غَمُّ الشَّدِيد And that غَمُّ الشَّدِيد That severe distress is further described by العظيم Great. You can't explain it in words. The agony, the distress that Nuh salam suffered when calling people to Allah. Some have said that Al-Karb over here refers to Al-Gharaq, drowning. Because drowning is also, yeah, it's extremely painful. Extremely painful. Have you ever been in water, your head submerged in the water, and you feel like, of course you cannot breathe. You can't breathe, you can't open your mouth, you cannot inhale. How long can you stay like that? You need to get out. Karb, drowning. Min Al-Karb al Allah saved them. وَنَصَرْنَاهُ And we helped him, we saved him مِنَ الْقَوْمِ From the people, which people? الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا Those who denied our ayat. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمَ سَوْءٍ Indeed, they were a people of evil. They liked evil, they did evil, they did bad. Which is why they didn't like Nuh salam telling them anything. فَأَغْرَقْنَاهُمْ So we drowned them أجمعين altogether. Not even one was spared. Because Nuh a.s. in Surah Nuh, Ayah 26, we learn that وَقَالَ نُوحٌ رَبِّ لَا تَذَرْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّارًا He said, O oh my Lord, do not leave upon the earth from among the disbelievers even one inhabitant. Don't spare even one of them. Was he justified in making a dua like that? Of course he was. 950 years he tried. And he didn't just sit there. He actively tried calling people to Allah. 